stop there being feedback, etc. Um, we are live streaming on YouTube. That means that unless you turn your camera off, you might appear on YouTube. So if you don't want to be seen, just switch off your camera. Um, there's a chat function on the right hand side on Zoom. So if you want to pose questions to our brilliant panel, who I'll introduce in a moment, please just write your question there and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible from the panel. Um, if you're following on Twitter or on YouTube, you can also put questions to the panel. So on YouTube, there is a chat panel. So use that. Or if you're on Twitter, use at Centre for MH, at Centre for MH on Twitter. And again, your questions will get picked up. Um, so we are, we've got live captioning on this. So if if you're on Zoom, if you look to the bottom of your screen, there is a little button called CC closed caption. So if you want to use closed caption, just press on that and then click show subtitles. Also, um, in, the, in the chat, there's a transcript that's live there that you can watch. So, um, I hope that all makes sense and we really want this to be accessible. If you've got any issues, there are a number of people on this call who you might notice have got a very lurid colour of green behind them. Those people work for the Centre for Mental Health. So do just contact them if you've got any issues about access or anything like that. Just, you know, they're your, they're your women and men. Okie doke. So, um, I think that we've had two years of exciting discussion we haven't always immediately agreed, and you'd expect that because this is the joy of difference and diversity, but we've reached some solid conclusions and we really want this to be a springboard for action. This is not just a report. This is now a network of people who want to make a difference and we're absolutely determined to do so. We've got some fabulous speakers coming up and they are as follows. Nathan Dennis, who has been a core member of our commission, He's also, uh, among other things, a trustee at First Class Foundation. Um, we have got Sarah Hughes, who many people will know, who's the chief executive of the Centre for Mental Health. We've got Councillor Rebecca Charlwood from Leeds City Council, who's um, executive member for health, well-being and adults, and also the local authority's mental health champion. We will have Dr. Rosina Allen Khan, the shadow minister for mental health. We've got Steve Gilbert, OBE, not forgetting the OBE, uh, a lived experience consultant. Um, he was vice chair of the Mental Health Act Review um, and is a trustee of mind and an associate for the Centre for Mental Health. So it's quite a lineup. And um, I might mention actually that we did also invite the minister, but um, as well as the shadow minister, but unfortunately nobody was able to, to come from government just on this date. Right, okay, I think we're on. So I would like to introduce Nathan. And Nathan, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Liz. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, just as a way of interaction, does everyone just type in the chat, mental health for all, just bam. Let's hit the chat, let's get some energy. I know we're online, but we still can be interactive. Um, my name is Nathan Dennis. Thank you, Liz, for introducing uh, me. I'm going to show you all some slides and hopefully we're going to have a nice quick discussion with the time that I have. I'm putting my stopwatch on my timer because I get passionate about this. And trust me, if I don't time myself, I might go over time. But well, good, good morning. And um, thank you to the Centre for Mental Health for inviting me to speak. Um, we've been on an epic journey um, as a commission, and I just want to share some thoughts around why mental health for all is important, especially in this climate. So as well as being a trustee at my charity that I founded called First Class Foundation based in the West Midlands, I also am the senior consultant at a consultancy that I've set up called Legacy Consultants. And for those who like to follow people on social media and stuff like that, please, please feel free to follow me on social media, tweet me, hashtag me, whatever you do. Those are some information and contact information. But going back to today, um, why is 
today so important um, as a report launch? And why is equality um, in mental health important? I wanna, I wanna say this, um, when you read our report, you're gonna see um, a line that talks about the black report that I believe was done literally 40 years ago. And unfortunately, some of the information, the data, the experiences of certain communities during that time over 40 years ago hasn't changed. And for me as a commission member, at first I'll be completely honest, when Andy Bell um, contacted me, I was kind of resistant because I was thinking, is this gonna be another talking shop? Is this just gonna be another academic exercise, but no change? But actually going through the process and doing our evidence review call for evidence and having a conversation and understanding how people think within the mental health sector, I've realized that actually this is like vital and critical work. There are too many of our communities from different protective characteristics that need our support, that we need system and systemic change. Um, there's a problem. The data is showing that there is a problem. And tragically, um, I think to be honest, COVID-19 has really um, highlighted and become like a micro, um, like, you know, like a magnifying glass just to say, that's highlighted some of the economic and social issues and really showing that certain communities are struggling, especially in COVID. Um, so being here today is very important. We really are passionate as a commission to not just launch another report, but actually to make system change and to make a difference. So welcome everybody, because you are all what I'm going to call today our change agents. And I think that during this year, we've seen many things happen. We've seen the explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement. And what I'm going to do very briefly is just share some thoughts around why I think actually this is a great opportunity, but just to put some thoughts into your, um, your mind around how mental health can impact, but specifically from an African Caribbean community perspective. So I'm gonna share some slides that hopefully will just trigger thoughts and give you some thoughts to think about as we journey together. So one of the things that we're passionate about, as I said, is that we don't wanna just engage as a commission, your intellectual mind, but we want to this morning engage with your heart. If you want to actually, you can just type in the chat, heart, the word heart. Cause it's important because I think that We've had many reports in the past and we've known the data. And to be honest, some of the information that you'll read in our report won't be nothing new, but there has to be some kind of change differently. And I think if we can connect with our, our minds and our heart together, I believe that we can truly make um, systems change. But I wanna put some challenges to us to consider. And especially when we're thinking about systems change, who's really in control of the mental health service or the system or its offer. Because I think we need to, if you look at the fingers of this slide here, I think we have to look at everything from a broader sense in terms of the funding support, the underground um, work that happens and, and is commissioned in, our, in, in the UK. We have to speak to politics um, and politicians. We really have to look at the system and see what are the things that need to change to, to change how this thing's being controlled. Cause when I'm thinking about it from a African Caribbean perspective, and hopefully what I say to you is gonna make sense in a minute, is that I do believe that we're navigating a, I would say a new terrain and a terrain of opportunity. Obviously this week we've seen um, what the FA have done um, in terms of um, the chairman stepping down and other things. And we've seen the, the, the massive conversations around Black Lives Matter. But I want to just give you some thoughts and, and try and link it to mental health. So for many of us, or for many people on social media, you'd have seen loads of images and stuff in the news around hashtag Black Lives Matter and protest since the tragic death of um, George Floyd. But one of the things I think that people sometimes forget, and this is why mental health for all is important, is we don't understand sometimes the psychological impact that if you're Black Britain, or British or anyone, because I know not just black people was affected by the footage that was out there. But many people forget to see that like, what we see in terms of the social media footage is just the tip of the iceberg. 
and that actually there's a wider, bigger picture that's beneath the surface. Um, you know, when we look at iceberg, it's like 15, 10 times bigger beneath the surface. And for many black people, when they've seen that, and just from the work that we do for our charity, many reports of increased feeling of anxiety, fear, anger, confusion, feeling sad, feeling hopeless, feeling numb. And we have to be able to change the system so that those communities, not just the black and ethnic minority, but I am focusing on the Afro-Caribbean community specifically for my talk. But we have to understand that there's a greater and bigger picture of things that are beneath the surface that are impacting um, communities. Many people have talked about Black Lives Matter and think that it happened or it started with George Floyd. But this is just a short timeline, just to put some thoughts into your mind, that injustice, inequalities have been happening from before 2020 and George Floyd. Stephen Lawrence, the Windrush, slavery, a quick narrated story, I'm a grandchild of grandparents that came to England as part of the Windrush generation. And from a mental health perspective, I want to show you this. Imagine they're growing up in the Caribbean and because the Caribbean is under British rule, was taught that England was the motherland. And after World War II was, um, was told, come to England and help rebuild it because this is your motherland, we need your help. So my grandparents and grandma came over from the Caribbean to England. But one of the first things that they faced, and my, my, even my wife's mom remember seeing signs like this, they was faced with signs saying, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Some of you are probably listening and thinking, why is Nathan talking about this? What has this got to do with mental health? I want you to think about the psychological impact of coming here, believing that this is the motherland, and when you're trying to rent property, this is the sign that you see. Some of you probably don't get it, so I'm gonna use it now in modern day. Right now we're in a global lockdown, or UK lockdown at least, lockdown two. And for many of us, I don't know if you've had that moment where you've run out of your car or you've come off the bus or you've jumped out of the Uber, run into the shop and you've seen this sign, no, uh, please, hold on, before you come in here, please wear your face mask. And you know that for some shop stores, if you do not have your face mask, you can't get entrance or access. But imagine this is how some of my grandparents and people from the African and Caribbean community felt. So when we look at the statistics and we see like the, um, the kind of mental health act rates and the people that are being admitted into mental health services, you have to understand that there's been a psychological journey that people have been on. So imagine that you can see that now. Some of the work that we have done successfully in the West Midlands, and I'm frankly and happy to say that it was evaluated by the Center for Mental Health. And it found that when we was doing some work with young African Caribbean males around improving their mental health resilience, there was something that was coming up in the evaluation report that was talking about to really make a difference in the service was a fact around having relatable role models that looked like the individuals that you're trying to engage. And there was another thing that came out strongly, which was about creating psychologically and culturally informed spaces where you engage with people through talking therapy, group therapy, speaking to people about how they're feeling, but also making sure that the, the spaces that the mental health service was being delivered in was culturally appropriate. So that's in terms of the music, the food, the furniture, making them feel at home, like a home from um, home experience. Um, and these were some of the, a few of the things that came out of the work, but also what some of the sad things that came out was some of the significant risk factors around, especially for African Caribbean communities, around living in poverty, housing insecurity, homelessness, difficulties at school, the experience of race, racism, the wear and tear, living in unsafe neighborhoods. These are all stuff that came up. Now, going back to this report, I think, we have to work better with the system and change the approach of how we do things. And one of the suggestions I'm gonna make, there's many that I could make, but my time wouldn't allow me to, is to talk about um, funding and resources for some of the organizations that are working with our different communities from across the protective characteristics. Yes, I focus my presentation and talk around the African Caribbean community 
And please note, and this is another conversation for another day, I'm not using the word BAME. I'm, very, I'm being very specific around African and Caribbean communities because after seeing certain stuff, I'm not actually feeling that we should be using the word BAME, but that's another conversation. But one of the things I'm going to quickly highlight is around funding. I think that we have to look at how grassroots services are being funded because we have to be careful that we're not becoming like a drip service where I know our experience as a smaller organization is that historically larger charities within the mental health sector have come in and given us what I would call pittance to deliver a service and then it's like a drip amount and it keeps us just alive but actually if just like in using this as a metaphor if you kept a patient on a drip the patient will actually die because they actually need to get more nutrients into their body and into their system. We have to be careful that and make sure that the resources flow through to grassroots organizations that are providing stuff for disability communities, um, providing stuff for the LGBTQ plus communities and other protective characteristics. We've got to make sure because at the end of the day, we want to save lives and prevent more people getting sick with mental health, we need to take them off the drip and we want them to come back. So the question to everyone to think about is, are we using the right methods, systems and approaches when we're thinking about mental health equality? Remember what I said about who's controlling it? We need everyone involved to make a difference. I wanna leave us with this image and just use the statement that many would be familiar with, especially for those who are around the NHS is the snowy white peaks. I've been quite alarmed through my charity work of every time I go up the ladder and I have to speak to commissioners, funders, decision makers, how white it is at the top. And I think we need to address that to then address the inequality that's happening down on the ground. We're really passionate as a commission to bring about change. So I'm imploring everybody, let's work together to make a difference so that we can save the next generation from the mental health fire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. Um, really, really interesting. And, and one of our, I'm sure Sarah will talk about this in a moment, but it's exactly for the reasons that you're talking about that one of our recommendations is about the need for public services to invest in the community-led, uh, culturally competent and aware services to make them more sustainable. So we don't have these, you know, lots of little bits and bobs of great services that actually are so fragile that they can't have the long-term impact and they can't evaluate and so on. Um, but uh, anyway, I don't want to steal Sarah's thunder. So our next speaker, without further ado, is Sarah Hughes. Uh, and uh, really, really pleased to introduce you, Sarah, to talk about what's in the report. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you so much, Liz. And good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to finally be able to talk to you about our um, reports at the end of uh, a long two years uh, where we have uh, sought to engage with communities and experts from around the country. And I just kind of want to um, start by saying, you know, I have worked in mental health for a long, long time. And there is no doubt that uh, inequality has been the insidious underbelly of that experience um, and it's really hard to articulate really where we kind of came from at the beginning you know what we wanted to achieve and and where we thought we might go and and of course we've not really ended up where we thought we would and that's partly because we wanted to engage with our partners in an authentic um an, in an authentic way but of course the pandemic created a mobilization uh, and a, a kind of passion and intention to, to create a roadmap that we really thought might be of help. We're really clear, and I think, um, you know, it, it's never good to say this when you're launching a report, but our report, you know, it's not new news. It's, uh, it's not even, and I'm, I won't look when I say this, but it's not even incredibly groundbreaking. And the reason for that is because we're coming on the back of decades of discussion, reports, inquiries, investigations. 
And so really when we thought about doing this work, we knew that we were you know, embarking on a challenge around how do we actually get the information heard? The information is already there, the knowledge, the understanding, we know it, it's about action. So that's why we've created the, the 10 point plan. And just also before I go on, we are in the middle of uh, our second wave of the pandemic. And I know many of the people on this call are dealing with huge struggles, either because they are dealing with um, trying to deliver services, making really difficult decisions, just trying to hold it together. So um, the centre is in solidarity with you and we send you all our love and best wishes for the winter to come. But with that said, um, Emma, can you uh, do the next slide for me, please? Great. So, so why did we we do this? So, um, Andy and I uh, feel that you know this commission was very much um, brought on because at the time we thought that the quality of the discussions around equality and mental health were not as sophisticated as we thought they should be. And this was a bit of a surprise to us. We have got some of the most extraordinary uh, activists in mental health uh, equality, you know, some of which are on this call and, and you know, someone uh, later, Steve, is going to, going to speak for us. Um, but we felt that, you know, this wasn't a collective approach. And we thought that, you know, we had got to a point where inequality was just sort of accepted as a fact of life. And we just thought, well, it's not, you know, it's not a fact of life. You know, we know that it damages people's well-being and causes harm that can last a lifetime, that can last generations and generations to come. And we really felt, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. And we absolutely were not going to collude with that narrative around, well, you know, it is what it is. And so our vision uh, is of a society where everyone's mental health is valued throughout their life. And we believe it is possible to create better mental health in society through actions informed by evidence. Now, again, I'm talking about the collective evidence we have generated across this sector, that communities have let us in, they've told us their stories, we've collected data. We've got really robust evidence. And we believe that a mental health system where inequalities are addressed and redressed is achievable. So we're talking about, you know, not just creating new things, bringing on new initiatives. We're talking about really addressing the imbalance that we find in uh, health and social care policy. Next slide, please, Em. And of course, look, you know, um, it's really easy, isn't it, to do presentations, read reports and write reports. But, you know, people are at the heart of this. We know men and women from African Caribbean communities in the UK have higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder and suicide risk and are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Children from the poorest 20% of households are four times as likely to have serious mental health difficulties by the age of 11 as those from the wealthiest 20%. You know, these are, you know, this is stark and this is not just a UK phenomenon. We know that this is um, a global uh, fact of life right now. Next slide, please. Em. So how did we work? So we uh, were really lucky. We uh, were approached by a uh, gentleman's memorial trust, uh, Elliot Simmons, and we uh, were given the opportunity at the time to say if we could give you some money, what would you do with it? And, you know, it's really hard to get funding for this type of, uh, of thinking. And so we, we, you know, we absolutely said, you know, this is what we wanted to do and they supported us. So we set up this commission and we were absolutely delighted when uh, Liz agreed to uh, chair the commission and we had an open recruitment for members. We had a call for evidence, over 100 responses. We had visits, we did workshops, we conducted evidence reviews. Uh, we held a series of briefings on determinants of mental health and access to support and experiences and outcomes. So as we went on throughout the commission, we were trying to synthesize what we had learned at each stage. Next slide, please, Em. And look, this is what we found, the triple barrier of mental health equality. 
So we found unequal determinants of mental health, unequal access to mental health support and unequal experience and outcomes. So if you're in that group of people who um, are less likely to uh, receive mental health support, that actually makes a difference, that you're somebody who already is in a vulnerable situation. This is a kind of perfect storm for you to be continually excluded from help and support uh, for a lifetime. And so uh, this kind of triple barrier uh, approach is really an opportunity for services and decision makers to see clearly exactly what we're talking about. Next slide. Um. So look, I'm probably preaching to the choir here because I'm sure those people who sign up for a, a webinar about mental health equality already have signed up to, you know, um, to, to realise some of this ambition. But of course, you know, this is what causes mental health inequality. Uh, inequality are, inequalities in mental health are social and economic. Wealth, poverty and ec economic inequality are really at the heart of this. And when you look at the graph, you can see that for mental health, you know, the significant impact around income security and social protection, you know, is, is, is great and is across the life course. In relation to power, this is a really important aspect of what we found. Discrimination, racism, misogyny, violence, oppression, injustice, all of these things are the insidious kind of thorns that uh, exist within communities, workplaces, institutions. And of course, even over the last week, we have seen quite astonishing um, you know, things that, you know, over social media, you know, in institutions, around behaviour, language, that, you know, I, I think demonstrates exactly what we're talking about here. Next slide, Em. So what can change this? Look, you know, we don't have a magic wand. And, you know, we know one of the things that we always understand that can be a problem when we're trying to resolve a, um, a really complex issue is that people want the simple answer. And I'm afraid, you know, we're not here to tell you that the answer to resolving the issue of inequalities is simple. It's absolutely not simple, but it does demand, um, you know, collaboration, attention, focus and acceptance of the problem. But we have created a kind of model for people to think about. So these are the sort of domains that we think can make a real difference. And this is very much in response to the evidence that we heard. So um, early year support. You know, look, we, we all know the consequences of not being able to engage uh, children and families at the earliest opportunity. And so we really talk about how do we enable uh, children and families to engage in the system when they need it, but also are engaged in, in communities that can resolve that, you know, sort of less formalised support. Inclusive education. Um, if you follow the centre, you will know that we absolutely despise school exclusions. Um, we uh, absolutely think that they harm um, young people for a lifetime. Some never, ever recover from school exclusions. And so we really want to see an inclusive education that really pays attention to the vast spectrum of difference that we have in our school system. That's not just about culture and race, that's about disability and other experiences and so we know that for certainly young black men the school environment has systemically excluded them for decades workplace justice and again this is you know we've not used the words you know workplace equality or work workplace you know um, inclusion we're actually talking about uh, justice and equal opportunity for people to be in, able to engage in the workplace under whatever circumstances and so you know we, we think that it's no longer good enough to say well you know we've got you know equal opportunities we've got this actually in some environments that doesn't go far enough and we really need to hold true to the principles around justice and equality, which we think has um, we've stepped away from that in terms of workplace practice. Reduced economic inequality. And again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand what this means. It links with a fair benefit system. We, you know, we, we absolutely understand that. Um, 
in local communities, particularly whereby, you know, the baseline funding for public health or the way in which the formula has been worked out for some areas over others doesn't actually in effect meet the needs of that local community, nor does a benefit system which operates on a, a, a sanction um, a sanction approach. So, so we don't support the current way of working and therefore we think that there are better ways of operating a fair welfare system safe and secure housing. And I always say, you know, I mean, it astonishes me sometimes that housing is a, a much more controversial issue in the country than, than it should be. Of course, we understand that if somebody is experiencing uh, mental distress or has a serious mental illness, that not having stable housing is going to be a contributor to de further deterioration. And in some instances, you know, it's absolutely crisis point. You know, you can, we can, absolutely provide the best mental health care in the world and I think in some instances we do but if we are sending somebody home to a leaky bedsit we might as well be just um, you know uh, pouring our services into a leaky bucket. Racial justice and again you know um, you will see and note the Centre for Mental Health will soon launch our strategy and the reason for moving from the language around equality to the language around justice is very much about this is the, the aim in which uh, we want to get to is about justice. It's it, and, and equality is the vehicle in which we want to get there. Um, we know that racial justice over the over the last few years has been a subject of um, a great challenge and people have been kind of uncomfortable about using this language but we feel like we've got to a, a tipping point where this is incredibly important. We heard some powerful testimony from people with lived experience and services where um, experiences of racism uh, was not only kind of life destroy destroying but community destroying as well. An inclusive economy. So again, you know, what do we mean by that? Well, we, we'll talk about it a bit more and, and I'd be really keen for Andy to mention something more about this later on. But we describe in the report the idea of an anchor organisation. Now, to, to um, Nathan's point earlier on, you know, um, grassroots organisations and some community groups often can't access funding or they certainly can't meet the criteria for fund for, for some funders or they can't you know engage in the procurement process and so on and so forth we invite uh, larger organizations where you know that might be a, a mental health trust that might be a large mental health charity to act as anchor organizations where they can and we have seen over the summer great examples where that has happened so mind acted as that repository for emergency funds that went across the mental health sac sector Ensun did the same and and they did that for grassroots organizations particularly those working with black and minority ethnic communities and so you know it's interesting because that means that we're challenging the power play there in communities and we want to see much more of that next slide please em so this is it in a nutshell this is our system that's designed for equality and we're going to talk about you know um, each of these domains but we see that um, mental health is really made in communities and civil society so really that has to be a priority in terms of how we attend to and support communities to grow and thrive. We know that at some point people need to access public services and so therefore what do we need to see um, public services step up to? National policies and local systems. So hopefully we'll be able to give um, local systems an opportunity to, to really assess and think about where they are in relation to each of these domains. Uh, next slide, please, Em. So communities and civil society. As I say, mental health is made in communities. We want to see, and, and you know, we have seen a lot of examples of this, um, provide opportunities for mutual aid, collective action and positive identity. And this is very much, again, you know, um, uh, 
uh, something about, you know, that we've seen over the pandemic. We saw mutual aid pop up in many communities. We saw collective action around, you know, acting for kindness and so on, which is um, a nice reflection in Kindness Week. And, um, you know, positive identity. And so again, you know, thinking about where there are communities with large populations of um, particular groups that, you know, that is supported and um, celebrated that businesses, charities, faith groups and others in civil society also have a key role. And, you know, when we think about the way in which things are decided at a local level, often you find the decision makers around the, the, those tables don't represent all of these groups collectively. And so we're, we're um, uh, suggesting that at local level, that decision making function is truly across the community and not just um, a bureaucratic kind of process, which we think it's, it sort of feels like that at the moment. And charitable funding still needs to address the class barrier. If anybody knows me, you will know that the issue of class is something that I feel deeply, strongly and passionate about. And I think what we find, um, you know, in our system, that the issue of class is manifested in terms of relationships, connections, who gets funding and who doesn't. And we talk a bit more about that in the report. Next slide, please local councils so I've mentioned the anchor institution role and again you know let's let's think about that because it will require bigger organizations to be brave and um you know I remember in in my last job we we did a lot of that you know certainly my organization was the anchor for smaller much more um grassroots uh act, you know activities and and group peer support and it worked incredibly well but it, it is a challenge and it's not all always the cheaper option so we always need to hold that in mind housing and homelessness I I always have said that I think the um, values of the nation can always be tested um, in terms of how we deal with the most vulnerable people and housing and homelessness has been a really interesting um, experience uh, uh, over the summer uh, certainly over the pandemic uh, you know in terms of the policy that that came about take people off streets put people back on the streets, take people off the streets, and a real kind of lack of uh, strategic thinking across um, with partners about really understanding, you know, that, um, it, it, you know, that we've got to attend to the um, dearth of social housing that we have available at the moment. Inclusive education, you know, again, I've talked about that. We haven't, I haven't mentioned digital connectivity, but we must absolutely acknowledge that digital exclusion right now is is creating a dynamic whereby many people can't access the services that they need with the huge transformation that you will see in public services moving services online and climate change flood protection and built environment we know that often the people most vulnerable in uh, flood areas are those people uh, the least able to deal with it now i know i'm running out of time so next slide please em Public services, mental health services that are comprehensive, no one left behind. And we really mean that in a true sense, working with public health um, partners to really understand the nature of, of your communities, engaging in skill sharing, tailored to people's needs, holistic in their approaches, responsive to people's wishes. And again, this is a really important nuance. So, you know, we've, we, we have people at the heart of it, but it's also about listening to what people want accountable for achieving change. And we really feel very strongly about this, that the advancing mental health uh, equality strategy that's just been published by the NHS must be achieved in full, as should the patient and care race equality framework. Next slide, Em. National leadership. Um, we really do need uh, the government to absolutely commit to mental health equality as a national ambition. It's not good enough to have a, a equality rhetoric without policy that supports it. I mean, it is tiresome, I have to say. Enable local and community led action, take steps to reduce income inequality and address racism, including hostile environment policies. Um, certainly over the last few days, I think that, um, you know, the new uh, immigration policies that, that, that came out were, you know, certainly not in my name and I'm sure many of yours. Um, next slide, please. We've got a 10 point plan. And um, I, I think that bearing in mind time, I'm just gonna whiz through these. 
support sustainability of community organisations. You know, it really is important that we, we hold true that very fabric of our local communities. We must not kind of let, um, you know, a, a national conglomeration, um, you know, kind of run our local systems. Boost local authority funding. I mean, it really does need to be addressed. We cannot continue under these circumstances. Maximise anchor institution roles, implement advancing mental health equalities in full, develop whole population mental health service offer. Next slide, please, Em. Create accountability for reducing inequality in mental health support. So, you know, we, we need to collect data. We need to understand what the levers and the consequences are for, for, for not addressing it. Reduce income inequality and poverty, tackle racism and discrimination, commit whole government to reducing mental health inequality and update and refresh the public sector equality duty. Um, all of which is um, absolutely expanded in the report so that you can understand in more detail what these are. And I think I've come to the end of my presentation, Em, is that right? There's no other slides. There's our report. Please do read it and, um, you know, take it seriously. These things are top line, but please understand what they, uh, how you in your organisation can implement them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, it really is a sort of, uh, you know, a 10 point plan where some of those things are very tangible and immediate. It's ambitious, but there's some real tangible stuff in there to get a mental health for all. Um, we are slightly over time. I just want to check whether um, Rosina Allen Khan is here and whether, if so, you would prefer to speak now, because I know you had to get away for another meeting. Um, can I just check that? I can see that some of her team. Are yeah, here. hi, sorry. Um, Rosanna's just joining. She's just having a little bit of uh, technical difficulty, so she's not on the call just yet. Um, so she should hopefully be here really soon. Um, and can I, can I just check with you, Res um, does Rosina need to be away by 11? Is that right? Yeah, she's got she's got another meeting at 11 um, and she had a meeting um, from 10 to half 10, so <laughs> it was quite jam-packed. So. I'm just wondering, um, with apologies to Rebecca, I'm just wondering whether, um, if Rosina can overcome the technical difficulties, whether we might just reverse that order and uh, hear from Rosina Allen Khan first. Would that work? Um, yeah, well, what, I can check and see how long um, this is going to be, first of all, in two seconds. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Rhys. Apologies, everybody. I just didn't want to squeeze the time so that um, we couldn't hear from the Shadow Minister, and I'm sure we all want to. Um, and we also very much want to hear from Rebecca on uh, local leadership and what's been happening in Leeds, which I think is really important. And um, because I think the whole, our whole approach has been things have to be done nationally, they also have to be done locally. Some of this can be uh, resolved effectively at local level but some of it needs national action it's about it's a it's a it's a belt and braces you know systemic approach really um sorry i am pausing yeah i i think um while rosanna is not on um maybe just go with the plan schedule and that way if we have to run all if Rosanna has to stay a little bit after 11 we'll just let the next meeting know um okay know, why thank if that's you. Right. sorry thank, for, sorry thank, about that. thank you so much well listen message me in the chat Reese. if um if uh if you if you need to um you know bring uh Ros Ros Rosina in um so okay well in that case um I'm really delighted to introduce Rebecca Rebecca sorry about um that little bit of confusion um but you're extremely welcome I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentation about uh, uh what you've been doing in Leeds which sounds really great okay thank you very much for the um, introduction and um I'm looking forward to hearing from Rosina as well um it I'd associate myself with the comments that have been made before um and it's wonderful to be part of your um, launch so thank you for having me so I'm the chair of the Leeds Health and Wellbeing Board and um I'm the executive member for adult social care and public health in Leeds City Council Leeds covers a population of 800,000 people um, and I'm also engaged at the West Yorkshire Integrated Care System um and I'm on that board um, which covers two and a half million people. So we have quite a big um, uh, impact and uh, uh, geography that we cover. And in Leeds, we've had an aspiration for many years now to be a city where people who are the poorest improve their health the fastest. 
um, we put that into our mental health uh, uh, strategy and our uh, health and wellbeing strategy as key um, headline uh, 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 outcomes that we wish to achieve. I've dedicated my whole adult career to mental health. I was a mental health worker when I left university and I've worked nationally with uh, mental health charities as well. Um, so I'm delighted to be the mental health champion for the city. So it's a role I take great pride in and I try to ensure mental health is considered in all decision-making and meetings. We, um, we all care very, very deeply about mental health in Leeds and the Health and Wellbeing Board brings together the senior executives from all our NHS trusts and our um, representatives from the third sector, um, representatives from Health Watch and ourselves in the council. So we have all got a vital role to play uh, talking about our own experiences, where that's suitable, and making sure that we challenge the taboo, um, that the subject of mental health can be discussed and that people can actually bring their whole selves to work and that their mental health is as valued equally as their physical health. And I bring personal experience. I had a, a year in a mental health unit when I was a teenager with depression. And I'm also very passionate about recovery and the fact that people can move through these difficult periods in their life and that it should just be an accepted part of our of our lives that people go through. But tackling inequalities is a huge priority which runs through our whole city approach to mental health. And we actively focus on working alongside communities whose mental health outcomes are some of the poorest in the city. Public health grants focus on areas of the city where uptake for the improving to access to psychological therapies program is low, that's IAPT, or where there are higher levels of crime, social housing, unemployment and mental health problems more generally. Our public health team facilitates a range of cross-council activities to influence partners to invest in promoting good mental health. And this includes encouraging and supporting frontline workers across the city to access mental health awareness training, including suicide prevention and mental health first aid, working with the children and families directorate and the council to help make Leeds a child-friendly city where we get in early with good mental health and good connection with parents. Supplying the parks and countryside service, for example, with the evidence base for the positive impact of green space on well-being and embedding safety and suicide prevention into conversations with construction contractors and engineers. Leeds City Council's public mental health team and Leeds Community Foundation, which is a grant giving body uh, for local uh, projects, have worked in partnership to set up the Leeds Men's Suicide Prevention Programme in order to, for the first time, work directly with men who are Leeds' highest at-risk group. The successful grants programme is funded to deliver work prioritised in the citywide suicide action plan and recurrent funding for men at risk of suicide has been prioritised. We also have suicide audits, which um, is unusual apparently, and we learn a great deal from those about where to target our uh, in intervention and resources on prevention. We commissioned the public mental health programme Mentally Healthy Leads through a third sector consortium who focused their efforts on groups considered at highest risk and living in areas of the city with high levels of deprivation. And the approach has five priorities. So improving mental health and well-being, reducing mental health inequalities, increasing resilience, reducing social isolation and reducing stigma and discrimination. Our lead provider Touchstone along with Community Links uh, the conservation volunteers and Oblong, they bring significant expertise and deliver services in our diverse communities where equalities and access and outcomes to mental health support are often present. They all have decades of experience of working with communities and grassroots organisations who understand people's needs and preferences. Activities centred on social interaction or creativity, art, music, food or exercise are, often, are offered to help communities engage with underlying messages about keeping mentally healthy. Mental health awareness training is also delivered and extensive engagement work to tackle stigma and discrimination is carried out in community spaces. We often find people engage with services that aren't badged as a mental health service that actually supports their mental health um, in a more well-being focus. We have a mindful employer program which is embedded in over 400 organizations across the city and during the pandemic this has enabled public health and our wider health and care system to engage with employers and individuals who might be at greater risk of stress and anxiety in this difficult time. Through the work of mindful employer their coordinators and peer-led network can really support people in the workplace and this includes care home workers, food delivery drivers, working in the gig economy, the latter, they're known to experience health inequalities and be less likely to access support for mental and physical health and more likely to come from our more diverse communities 
where coronavirus has had a devastating impact. And they're usually part of the young, lower paid and unemployed, underemployed workforce, where livelihoods are at greater risk in a recession. Our public health team are working with mentally healthy leads providers to explore and understand experiences of grief, loss and social isolation during COVID and the wider impact this has had on our communities. We've had a crisis of isolation at the same time as the crisis of uh, the pandemic uh, and that needs to be tackled and, and recognised. We also commission our Leeds Gypsy and Traveller Exchange, known more commonly as Leeds Gate, an organisation that's led by Gypsy and Traveller people. Sadly, the stigma and discrimination in that, to that community has led many people to understandably mistrust accessing local services. And Leeds Gate is commissioned to work closely with that community to tackle health and wellbeing issues affecting them and link to the wider determinants of health, poor mental health and healthy living. Unfortunately, ethnic inequalities in mental health are long-standing and exceptionally large, disadvantaging uh, BAME people or racialized people in access, care, treatment and outcomes. Racialized people or black, Asian and minority ethnic people have a higher risk of experiencing symptoms of psychosis and even higher risk for diagnosis of a psychotic condition are more likely to experience adverse pathways to and through care, a subject coercion and restrictive care compulsory admissions and treatments and poorer outcomes and follow-up. Indeed, in the Commission for Equality and Mental Health's third briefing, Inequalities of Experience and Outcomes, this was highlighted in the stark rates of detention under the Mental Health Act and the use of community treatment orders for those of different ethnicities. I was a mental health worker 20 years ago and the same was true then. We need to make a difference to this um, huge issue of inequality. And it's a shame, a great shame we haven't managed to uh, as a nation um, to date. The use of coercive powers do last longer for um, BAME people. So I and other leaders in the health and care sector in Leeds have come together with Joy Francis from Synergy to call for a commitment to tackle this issue. And as senior leaders of our mental health services and commissioners of mental health care, we have committed to a pledge to initiate fundamental service level changes to reduce eth ethnic inequalities and in access experience and outcomes, to measure, monitor and report the nature and extent of ethnic inequalities and the progress made, to work in partnership with local BAME communities, service users and relevant community agencies, to provide national leadership on this critical issue, to ensure inclusive and sustainable change in our localities and communities, to support timely and progressive research and policy development, and to contribute to a biannual progress update. We're really proud of that work, which we started earlier in the year before the Black Lives Matter movement uh, uh, became so um, uh, internationally renowned. And so we're really proud that we were already uh, taking action on that, but it's come you know, after many, many years of, of need. So as a consequence of this pledge, Leeds City Council, NHS Leeds Clinical Commissioning Group, our Mental Health uh, Partnership Trust, local stakeholder groups, of BAME voluntary organizations, community groups and activists. We're all collaborating with Synergy's creative spaces model to tackle ethnic inequalities in the risk and the consequences of severe mental illness among the city's BAME population. And through the pledge, similar work is also underway in London and Greater Manchester. And we know that making the necessary changes will be complex and will take time, but the scale of the task should not deter us from making a start in true partnership with the communities across the health and care systems. We live in very challenging times with concerns about the long lasting impact of COVID on mental health and mental health inequalities particularly. But in Leeds, we really believe our citywide approach to mental health, our all age mental health strategy and our commitment and signing up to these pledges um, uh, makes us really well placed to respond to the challenges. And long term, we, we absolutely intend to make a huge difference to those um, inequalities and those figures. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It's great to hear about those partnerships with different groups in the community and across all the agencies with the pledges. I mean, it just sounds really sort of, you know, uh, really uh, ways forward that other areas can learn from as well and learn as we all go in terms of what's working best. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, right. OK, now I think Rosina Allen Khan is with us and I'm really delighted to introduce Rosina, Dr. Rosina Allen Khan, who is, of course, the Shadow Minister for Mental Health. She's also, incidentally, my local MP um, and uh, I'm thrilled that she is 
here with us, uh, Rosina. Good morning. It's fantastic to be here. Um, and uh, thank you, Liz, uh, for, for saying that, that you are a local. And um, if you voted for me, thank you for keeping me in a job. And if you didn't, I hope I can do a better job for you next time so that you do. Um, it, it's an absolute honour to be here. And it's a real pleasure to follow Rebecca as well. I think when we talk about mental health, it's so powerful when we have advocates who also are very open about their own experiences. That takes an incredible amount of bravery and also really um, it comes from the heart. So, so thank you, uh, Rebecca, you know, for talking about your own, your own experiences. And I'd like to thank the Commission for all the work that you've done over the past two years to bring attention to and provide evidence-based solutions for, for mental health inequality. And when I was given this job, it was a job I really wanted because for me on a personal level, and on a professional level, uh, still practicing as a doctor, I have been an A&E doctor now for 15 years. It's, it's making me feel old, actually knowing that about myself. But um, never more important has it been than to talk about mental health and inequalities than it is now. We know that we have had a difficult time over the last 10 years, especially when it comes to funding of mental health services. We also know that existing health inequalities fuel mental health inequalities and we also know that adverse childhood experiences are huge drivers of mental ill health in later life as well as in childhood. So we've seen a perfect storm really over the last decade of, of significant underfunding in all sectors which have meant that now more than ever it's important that we're having discussions like this and work is being carried out like this and so I'm super proud to be part of this and we all know that mental ill health is something that can affect every single one of us. Whether you are black, white, Asian, whether you are gay or straight, whether you come from, you know, from privilege or a difficult socioeconomic background, it can affect you. But we also know that the impact isn't shared equally. Entrenched social and economic inequalities and an unequal experience accessing existing services mean that some groups of people will have worse mental health than others. We know that if you are a young black man, you are more likely to be diagnosed with mental ill health when you've already entered the judicial system. That's not right. That's something that really, really needs to change. And this leaves, this, this inequality leaves more people at risk of developing mental illness, likely to receive inappropriate support and less likely to recover. Since I was appointed as the Shadow Minister for Mental Health, working on ways to tackle mental health inequality has been one of my main priorities. This obviously comes from, and I alluded to it earlier, my, my work in A&E, where I've seen firsthand the impact of poor housing, um, what it does to people's physical and mental well-being for families. I've seen racism and discrimination, how that can push someone's mental health further towards crisis point. I see people coming in in the middle of the night when I'm doing a shift who've been unable to access services and are now so desperate. I've seen how poverty and financial worries negatively affect the state of mind of children and parents alike. But growing up where I have in Tooting, growing up at a time where living through poverty, where many of my friends were the same as me, I've just seen how some of my friends and people very close to me, how their mental health was impacted and the very real life struggles when it comes to accessing help and support. And I think that it's really, really important that we have very honest conversations and bring forward very honest examples of people who have been let down. Someone very close to me, a young black man, felt suicidal, had been asking for help for a year and was put on waiting list after waiting list after waiting list. It wasn't until he tried to take his own life that people actually stood up. We can't get to that point. We can't get people who are crying out for help to the point where they've waited so long that they then go on and actually commit a crime and are then locked up for the rest of their lives to the point that they will never go on to fulfill their potential. Their whole families ruined and torn apart. By tackling the root causes of mental health problems, we prevent issues from developing in the first place. And by ensuring that services are accessible and appropriate for everyone who needs them, we give everyone the support they need to overcome their difficulties. 
so many people, particularly in our in our LGBTQ plus communities, say that they struggle to access services. They say that they actually develop mental ill health very early on in their school years. And they say that when it comes to accessing support, they would really like to be seeing people trained up and supported to deliver services who have similar lived experiences to them. And I hear a lot being said in the same way from our BAME communities. And already entrenched inequalities are being deepened by the COVID-19 crisis. The disproportionate impact of the virus on people from BAME communities, the less financially well off and the most vulnerable in society undoubtedly increases mental health risk factors and the disruption to services, which for many were already difficult to access in the first place, means that less and less people will get the help that they need. And as we go through the second spike and look to the recovery period, addressing this inequality must be a priority for the government. And doing this not only improves people's lives, it benefits our economy and society at large, but it is everybody's problem. It is everybody's issue. It's everybody's societal responsibility to understand that people are mentally healthy. And it's very easy for people to say, oh, well, I haven't experienced depression or anxiety, therefore it doesn't really matter to me. We have to do everything we can collectively to make sure we fight for service provision for those who need it the most, because it's our collective duty, it's our collective responsibility. And the Commission's findings make it absolutely clear that mental health policy cannot be created in a silo, and I couldn't agree more. Government must work cross-departmentally for a combination of health, social and economic policies to truly tackle mental ill health and there is no one size fits all when it comes to mental health support. Central government should work with local authorities, community groups and regional public health teams to ensure support is appropriate to the individuals receiving it. The approach has to be proactive and it has to be preventative. It can't be too late once a young person has already been failed by the system. It can't be it can't be too late when someone with dementia has gone so far down the line without any support for the family that the family just can't cope and develop depression themselves. It has to be a preventative community led in a national framework to end the postcode lottery that this current service provision sees. And investing in well-being is a choice that benefits all of us. And I make this promise that I will continue to do all I can to, to urge the government to make this choice and change their course and deliver the solutions needed to ensure equality in mental health. So I will just end by saying it's an honour to be part of this conversation. I couldn't be more proud of the work that everybody on this call today and watching this is doing in their own way. Everybody is equally important and through through all of us collectively working together, stamping out the inequalities that are existing in mental health, we together can help people's lives improve and fundamentally save lives as well. So thank you very, very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate and your, and your comments about cross-departmental work are very, uh, very important, I think, uh, and, and uh, all your points about inequality. Um, have you got time to take a question maybe? Um, I, I'll, I'll take a question. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. It's been one of those days. Yes, I'll, I'll take a question. I think we had one from Marsha. Marsha, are you there? Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment? Um, firstly, thank you for all that you do. Um, oh, welcome. I um, wondered, um, at the minute it looks, it seems like the government and the ministers are almost like they're they're living in surreal land. It's almost like they're the Marie Antoinette sort of let them eat cake. Um, that's how it feels. They're so detached from how I really live my life with mental health and that. And it does feel like it's a joke at times. Um, and so I'm wondering how. I, as a citizen, can help you make sure that you you get your voice heard. Oh, thank you, Marsha, for your question. And you're already you're already doing it. 
you know, you're you're having this conversation with me today and you are further fueling my desire to suck it to the government and make them listen. And thank you so much for your support. And maybe you saw my video uh, from last week where I asked Nadine Doris just in one in one uh, exchange alone, eight times if she would meet with me. And um, for those of you uh, that may not know, she's she's the Minister for Mental Health, but I'm sure you, you, you all know that already. But I asked her eight times, I said, will you meet with me to, to work cross party together? Because at the end of the day, mental health shouldn't be a political football really at all. Um, and she refused and her response was, that if I wanted to decide policy, uh, the Labour Party should try harder to win the next election. And, and for me, that, that yes, was, sorry. yeah, you saw that. That was really, that was really disappointing. But Marsha, we're, we're standing together right now. We're all in this together. And I, and I can promise you, I'm not going to stop asking. I'm not going to stop fighting for all of us. Um, but, but, what you, but what people can do, they can always write to their MPs. They can always, um, you know, be be vocal on social media if you feel like it. Tag in, tag in the minister and ask very politely. You know, why why will you not have a cross party discussion? Because we know that respectful pressure does ultimately show them that we are not giving up. Um, and I will never ever give up on you, Marsha. I'll never give up on you or any of the people in this country who are who are fighting to have the mental health provision that they deserve and that they need, and that mental health to have true parity of esteem with physical health. It, like, warm words isn't enough. When I see children coming into the A&E department in the middle of the night who are self-harming age 12, who've been trying to, to access CAM services, their families so desperate trying to access CAM services for a year, we will never give up on those children. When we see people who are suffering with postnatal depression who can't get an appointment to see someone, we will never give up on those people. We will never give up on, on the men who feel that it's not okay to talk about their mental health for fear of stigma and losing their jobs. We will never give up on those people. We're never gonna give up. That's why we're having conversations like today. That's why we're fighting with fire in our belly, Marsha. And that's why we will continue to do so. So thank you for all your help, love and support because without you, Marsha, I couldn't keep going. You know, it's, it's, it's hard work. But just hearing from you and your, your struggles and everybody's struggles, it fuels us all to keep going. And we will one day make headway. We will one day get them to have a conversation. But more importantly, and sorry to be political for a minute, um, actually, I'm not sorry. <laughs> we will have a Labour government and we will make the changes that we want and we will, we will tackle the health inequalities that exist. So thank you very much, Marsha. Thank you very much. And um, and I think probably we'd better let you go because I know you've got another appointment and you've, you, you, you squeezed in coming here for which we're really, really grateful. So no, I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm, 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 so, I'm, I'm very sorry. Yes, I'm, I'm spread very thin today, but I didn't want to miss this at all. So um, I, I didn't want to miss even the opportunity to be with you for half an hour. Thanks again for all that you do. And, and, and thank you for all the information that you send to me because that helps me put the arguments across. So um, I really appreciate it. And um, if anybody wants to get in touch, again, either individually or uh, collectively as an organization, I'm always here to listen. We're, we're all in this together and we all have an equally important part to play. So thank you very much again. And I, I hope to see you soon. Thanks very much. Uh, and discussions with all political parties to be continued. Um, Definitely. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, we're now, um, on to our final speaker. And um, I, this is a personal view from Steve Gilbert, which I'm really looking forward to. Steve, over to you. Thank you. Um, not an easy uh, person to follow, uh, but I will do my absolute best. Um, I'm, I'm reading from my notes because my memory is shocking. So if I look down, that's why. Um, so in 2008 and 2009, I had uh, major depressive episodes and made to take my own life. In 2010, I had a manic episode and was detained by the police under Section 136 of the Mental Health Act. I was then subsequently detained under Section 2 of the Mental Health Act um, and spent a tw total of 21 days in hospital, which is short by many standards, but is absolutely long enough to know the impact that detention can have on one's life. Um, I'm biracial, uh, and by that I mean that I have a 
a, a white mother and I have a black father. Um, much like Nathan's family, uh, my nan is from Jamaica and my granddad from St. Kitts, they are, uh, were the, uh, the Windrush generation. On my father's side, there are at least three of us who have been sectioned, um, including my father, and there are, um, there's a lot of uh, serious mental illness on that side of the family. And um, it would be quite an understatement to say that this has destroyed certainly the fabric of our relationship and certainly my relationship with my own family. Um, the role in which mental health services played is significant. Um, as is the role in which racism and racial discrimination. Um, I have a, a formal diagnosis of bipolar disorder and complex PTSD, and I'm very thankful to the, to the centre for inviting me to be part of your event today. I want to take you back to one of the first important pieces of work that I did, which was a, a programme called 300 Voices, and it was based in Birmingham. Um, and this is back in 2014. It was a program that was funded by the, the now no longer funded Time to Change. Um, and it was in partnership with West Midlands Police and Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Foundation Trust. Um, this is where I first met Nathan um, and it really shows the importance of local working. And the aim really was to improve outcomes for young African Caribbean men who come into contact with statutory services. And throughout that process, we collected um, quotes. We had um, some phenomenal um, young black men be part of that programme. And this is one of the quotes from one of the individuals. He said, I studied engineering at uni. I like doing creative stuff and playing chess. Before my diagnosis of bipolar and anxiety, I didn't understand what was wrong with me. I didn't want to go out, so I just stayed at home. The isolation led to my depression. I have people around me who love me, but when I was ill, I felt they couldn't relate to me. What gets me really down though, is feeling that society doesn't care about us black men. It's like we have to hit rock bottom before we get the help that we need. And then when I finally, get, finally do get help and I'm in hospital, it feels like I'm getting second grade treatment. I want the doctors to trust me, to talk to me about my mental health, to listen to me and help me work out strategies so that I don't keep coming back. When they don't do this, I just close up and can't trust them. When I heard that 300 Voices was highlighting the problems that black men face when trying to get help in the mental health system, I thought finally, maybe, more black men will now be able to get help earlier rather than having to go through a crisis each time. I think the sad thing reflecting about that is that like so many other reports and initiatives, through your voices effectively sits on the shelf. The funding ran out, the support for these young black men and this incredible process that brought together both staff and young black men and their families and community members isn't been utilized. And I'm gonna come back to that point in a few moments. Mental health inequality is not simply an abstract concept. One of the challenges we face is that nothing has changed for so many years that it has now always become fact, and Sarah alluded to this earlier. It seems as if we have become conditioned to believe that inequality is a fact of life, a certainty. This is not the case. Inequality, and more specifically, inequality in mental health care, does not have to exist. And I believe with every fibre of my being that if we all work together, that we can remove the word inequality from our vocabulary. That does not mean that this is at all easy. Far from it. But as this report so clearly sets out, it is absolutely possible. But it requires action and not simply well-meant gestures. So it's time that we change the facts. There are some difficult conversations ahead of us. Accept this as a fact and let's start the discussions. For some organisations, the report may call upon you to do things differently. 
to step out of your comfort zone. Accept as a fact that short term you will feel uncomfortable. It is a fact that the government will need to dedicate funding to support this much needed change. I sincerely hope that they hear and embrace this report and the message it contains. It is a fact that we already have some of the tools we need to create real change. We've heard some of them already. It is time to roll up our sleeves and to use these tools to go and do the work. Mental health services, and in my mind, the senior leaders and board members need to be held accountable for changing experiences and outcomes. We cannot sit by and see the same data and the same statistics year on year, decade on decade, and accept them as fact. That has to change, and it has to change now. It should be a fact that no matter the circumstances you are born into, that everyone should benefit from high quality mental health care at the earliest opportunity and to be supported to live a rich and fulfilling life. Poverty exacerbates mental health difficulties and this report calls on the government to reduce inequality of wealth and income. I long for the day when it is a fact that financial circumstances no longer contribute to poor mental health. I also long for the day when it is a fact that our government leads in tackling all forms of discrimination, racism and exclusion, and that we have laws that are robust and support this, and importantly, a very clear roadmap that will lead to mental health equality. One of my mentors says, you can't look good and get better at the same time. And that's okay. This doesn't demand perfection, but it does demand real and sustained commitment. It requires action. Words mean nothing. Action is the only thing. Doing, that's the only thing. The words of Ernest Gaines. One question that lurks, the elephant in the room. Whose job is it to solve this? If we take the focus of racism and racial injustice, it is not the job of black people to fix this. It needs white people to work alongside black people to change this, and I use that as a focus. The time for change is now, today, not tomorrow, not when we feel comfortable to have these conversations, not when we are simply ready, we start today. Now, I ask everybody watching this webinar to pick up a pen, or to pick up a digital device and to write down one thing that you will do today, one action that you will take that will move things forwards. And we're not moving on until I start to see that happening. So just to repeat, thank you. I want you to write down one thing that you will do immediately following this webinar, one thing one action that you will take today. Being on this webinar does not count. <laughs> Fantastic. And then what I want you to do is I want you to go and share this report with three other people and then ask them to do the same. Every single day that we wait to take action is another family that endures pain, another individual who through circumstances of birth alone will not receive the care and support that they need. This does not have to be a fact, and today we can write a new story. I've referenced 300 Voices, and along with my incredible and brilliant teammates at the time, we coined the phrase, better must come towards hope. And I am hopeful that this report can and will lead to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. And and I think the challenge to us all to, to be alongside, you know, I as a white woman want to be alongside um, black men and women. Um, and we need to extend that as well to, you know, gypsy and traveler communities and across all our differences, we all need to do that. 
Um, and thank you for the call to action, because that's what this is all about. This is not about the words on the page. It's about what we all get up and do in our different positions. So that's uh, fantastic. I want to open this up. If anybody wants to share uh, a suggested action for themselves or anybody else, that would be great. But I think we do have a couple of questions. I think we've got one from um, Phil Mawinney. And we've also got one from Atif Chowdhury, I think. Um, would you like to ask them yourselves? Um, I'm speaking now to Phil Mawinney, if you're here. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Phil Mawinney. I'm a policy manager at Independent Age, which is an older people's charity. There's a quick question for um, Councillor Rebecca. It's just one of your specific points about the grants that you were giving out to try and boost the uptake of IAT talking therapy services. Um, we just published a report on mental health and later life, and that included looking at the low levels of uptake of talking therapy among older people. So what you've done may or may not be relevant, but I just wanted to know how that worked and whether it had much of an impact. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, that's a really interesting uh, question, actually. Um, I chair the um, uh, Ageing Well Board for the city, it used to be called the Best City to Go Old in, and it's one of our um, key best council sort of um, uh, uh, things that we want to be uh, an age-friendly city. And we've sort of, you know, really, and I'm really proud of that work. So we do an awful lot around um, <clears throat> well-being and supporting well-being in our older population. Um, I, I'm going to suggest that we have, I get back to you individually about, about that, because I can get you some proper information that might help you with your, um, with your work. Um, if that's okay, if I could get your, um, contact details. Yeah. But I, that's a really good point about access to, um, talking therapies for older people. It's not something I've, I've personally been involved in, so, but I'm sure there's stuff going on. And if there isn't, we need to make it happen, don't we? So I'll get your contact details. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Right, okay. Um, Atif Chowdhury? Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the talks. They've been really you know, engaging and, and if not quite moving. Um, I guess I, my challenge is, I don't know if anyone can answer it, but I was, it's quite disappointing to hear about the, the lack of cross-party talks on this uh, and the terminology around the political football was used. Um, it's, it's quite deeply worrying. When I think about it, I think about the issues that what that means in terms of migrant communities coming across trauma in refugee status and ref, a lack of refugee acceptability, trauma through the media and, and the demonization of people coming across trying to safeguard their families. But also think about the legacies, the legacies or post-colonial legacies, um, be it partition where two and a half million people were killed and then having to build new lives, including lives in the UK and how their children have had to survive people piecing together that kind of dynamics and of course the legacies around Africa and what that means and fundamentally the, the power structures of systemic racism but what worries me is the lack of cross-party talks was stark for sure but when I sit and think about that what does that actually mean it means there's a lack of cooperation in the political part partners and there's a lack of cooperation in the joined up policies that are available but it also says something else, which is which has been touched upon. I think Steve's touched on it powerfully, and so has Nathan, and Rachel did as well, uh, and in particular uh, Rosanna. It, the systemic racism that is so prevalent, and it's on the buildings, the structures. I live in Brighton. It's a wonderful place of equality, but it's built through Georgian slavery, sugar slavery in particular. These things about belonging and safety, they are noticed by children. Uh, they're felt by children at a very young age. So when a political party doesn't look at the systemic role of racism around mental health, it is dangerous and it costs money. It will cost money long-term, it will cost money in maintaining uh, social economic access to people coping with trauma and long-term isolationism. And you sort of find yourself wondering, even if you didn't believe, believe in the systemic racism, the money side of things should speak to you. The social economics of not wasting money should speak to you. So how do you get these kind of values working for a wider society? If you have a political power, in this case, one that's in power, not actually believing in the root causes of mental health, it's a massive challenge. Thank you very much. One of the, um, I mean, I might just turn to 
Nathan or um, uh, um, or, or Steve, see if you want to add anything to, to this, but one of the things that the Centre for Mental Health do, has done is put on its website today a sort of template letter that you can use to write to your own MP of whatever party, and you can adjust it as you wish to. So, you know, if you want to particularly emphasise systemic racism or you particularly want to emphasise something else that's very pertinent to your own experience, whatever, you can do that. And I want, because one of the things that's, uh, members of parliament do listen to is what their constituents are telling them so um i mean i would say it's my commitment i'm going to write to my local mp but as we've just heard of my local mps rosina allen khan so um she may already be aware of all this but i would really encourage people to do that because if we did that all over the country then maybe we would get uh, MPs from the different political parties thinking this is something that matters to my constituents um, i would say liz just to jump in quickly is that we need something radical, but the same that is um, cohesive and collective where we're working together. Um, I do think, um, yes, the government leaders um, have a problem, but I do think we've got, I think the biggest problem from my observation in mental health is like, I don't think you charities talk enough and there's enough accountability because there's too many charities in the mental health space that it's almost like monopoly. If you look at the monopoly board, they have a monopoly over mental health, have ridiculous amount of resources in their accounts and in their reserves. And then when they want to commission services for people on the ground, really are giving some, when I say some like very, very offensive amounts to like do the on the ground work with the different people on the ground. And it's just ridiculous. And it's like everyone in these organizations, majority is all white and the class perspective as well classism and we have to break out of this cycle because for me and why at the near the end of the commission I was getting a bit tired even though it wasn't nothing personal with a fellow commission members but I was like we need to get out of this cycle of academic just rigor it's like all we're doing is just doing academic evaluation to say the same thing middle class people evaluating the situation get money to evaluate and it's just like this crazy cycle but no one on the ground and change is happening so sorry, Steve. I know you want to jump in. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, I mean, I completely agree. And and I'm I'm a trustee for one of the largest mental health charities, Mind. Um, I'm also a trustee for one of the smallest mental health based charities, the Association for Mental Health Providers. And the the economies of scale are just com completely different. Um, so it's a really a tale of two stories. And and I think there's there's um that there's a lot more that can be done there as, as 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 nathan has said i think the other thing and it always comes back to what liz was saying about about letters i think the i think the theme here is modeling the behavior that actually creates influence and i think that letter templates are a great way to start that i think what i know i've benefited benefited from and i'm sure that nathan will say something similar and i'm sure actually if we're all honest we've all benefited from is mentoring and learning the lessons and being led by people that have gone before us. I know that there are multiple people that are on this call right now that if I was struggling with something, I can pick up the phone and I can call them. Um, be that I be that I actually kind of want um, some very specific kind of almost industry um, support. But it also, if I just want some moral support and I just want to, you know, vent and scream at the world, and then they help me package it back up again. So I think Sarah and, and in the report, they talk about anchor institutions, about supporting smaller organisations. I think in some respects, alongside that, to kind of add to that granularity, you know, I know how hard me and Nathan have had to fight to kind of get to where we are. We're both from Birmingham. You know, Birmingham is a huge city. It's got, you know, ridiculous number of resources. Yet we have really had to fight. And there are lots of people who haven't quite found the same breaks that me and Nathan have, have found, um, who could go on to create amazing things. And it doesn't require money. It requires a bit of time. It requires a bit of nurturing. It requires a bit of support. So again, there are dim dimensions to this that haven't quite come out yet um, that I think will have huge um, implications because actually I do believe, certainly on a local level, that our politicians want to listen, that our business leaders want to listen, that our health leaders want to listen. 
Um, but I can also understand why they find it difficult to listen um, when either a message lacks, a message lacks clarity or it, it is too angry. And I, and, and, I, and I know that that is not something that sometimes we want to hear, um, but there is a communication task here. Um, and, you know, all of us know, because we've done it today, that you can come at this really, really strongly but respectfully and demand change. Um, so yeah, not, not, not to give Sarah and the centre any more work, but could you fix that? That'd be great. Yeah, on it, we're on it. Thank <laughs> you very much, Steve. We're getting, we're, we're on time. I want to suggest that we go on for another five minutes if people are up for it, if we can keep the link open. I'm, I'm getting a nod from Sarah, um, just because there's some really interesting things coming through. And one of the things that really strikes me, I mean, your point about, charity voluntary sector often being so white led I think any of us that have got any kind of voice or links into people who've got power or have power ourselves or whatever need to be opening doors and you know enabling other people to take the, to have those voices and take those positions of power um whether that's mentoring or whatever you know it's um right okay um we're getting Liz, can I jump in just quickly just to share a good case study quickly quickly is that possible? So I think Centre for Mental Health is modelling some of this, what we're talking about. If you unpack my journey with Centre for Mental Health very quickly, I've been around Centre for Mental Health for the last three years. First started off as they was evaluating us as an organisation. Then they opened the door for us to speak at Norman Lamb's office with our report launch. That, that um, expanded my social kind of like, if you're talking about social mobility and, and being in a room with people who had economical you know, influence or, or money, made a difference so that we was able to get resource into our organization. And then opportunities like this, like speaking at events like this and being able to showcase and disseminate our story. So there is powerful things that's happening. Mm -hmm. And then the center has, I don't know if Louis still on it, but Louis is like a phenomenal writer, one of the best writers I know, um, who helped us when it came to bid writing and been able to um, put, the, put the bid in a language that funders and commissioners could understand. So there is like a long relationship and we are working on this here to try and showcase that story because I think if we didn't have evaluation and didn't have the center come alongside, I'm guaranteeing you we would not exist today because the sector is so like, you have to jump through so much hoops and prove yourself. And then even sometimes I get up the, the ladder, ladder and people are saying, but have you got a gold standard um, random control trial and I'm like what the hell but anyway that's just a quick yes, I, it's a really good example and and partnerships and alliances are absolutely everything and thinking about power how to sh genuinely share power right we're getting some pledges in um so um Paul I hope you don't mind me Quoting this, Paul Cummings has said, after this webinar, I'll be speaking to councillors from around the northwest of England, talking about my role as a mental health champion and encouraging a greater focus on mental health and equality. That's fantastic. Um, uh, Steph De La Haye from Sheffield. We're developing more genuine collaborative user and peer led co-production with statutory services across the diverse range of community groups. I'm wanting to think, we've got a question, but I'm, don't, I'm sorry, I don't know what time for the question. How, do, how does the system really share power and resources? But I think we've just been talking about that. Um, one more question from Christine Burt. How are we going to ensure mental health for all includes people with learning disabilities? Would anybody like to answer that? Sarah, maybe? Look, I was just going to say Andy, because I, I think Andy's got Wait, something Andy. to say about that. Yes. Andy? Hello. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is really important. And, and you'll know that, that we support the Children and Young People's Mental Health Coalition uh, and their report last year really raised the issue of, of uh, the very high levels of poor mental health among people living with a learning disability and, and uh, uh, I think learning disabilities and neurodevelopmental conditions of all kinds, there were very, very high levels of poor mental health and it's very poorly responded to. Uh, and I think this is where a system designed for equality, again, we need to listen to what people say they want. That's the first place. We need to make sure resources are put into services that meet the needs where necessary. They can be adjusted uh, to meet someone's needs, whatever they may be. Uh, no two people will need the same adjustments. But again, we can do this. Um, and if we place the resources where they're required in order to, to 
understand the different things people require, then, then I think we can begin to have a system that actually answers this. And, and uh, inevitably, of course, people with learning disability are not homogeneous. Uh, there are, are a whole range of different things that intersect as well, uh, race, sexuality, uh, identity, gender, uh, and this is all part of the picture and, and, and why the kind of one size fits, fits all type uh, approach just gets us absolutely nowhere. Thank you very much. I think probably we should now bring this to a close. I would like to, first of all, thank our fantastic speakers. I'd also like to thank the Elliot Simmons Charitable Trust for supporting this work. Um, and I think it's been pretty clear from what people have said that this is not the end of a pro, this isn't we've done the report, you know, job done on to the next thing. This is the beginning of something. And I think there's a real appetite. Uh, I'd like to commend the Centre for Mental Health who I've been working with, great team, and they're serious about this. So um, within that seriousness, there'll be a lot more communication, there'll be a lot more networking, there'll be a lot more working together in partnerships to make this real and to make sure that we do end up with real commitments to change. And the one thing that, that excited me in the last couple of weeks was the British Social Attitude Survey that just came out and said two thirds of the British public, or the English public, I think it was, said, they think that the level of inequality in this country is unfair, unfair or very unfair. There is an appetite out here in our communities to change the level of inequality. Um, people have noticed it because of COVID. You know, I think there's a moment here to really grasp and make some headway. And we need to do practical things because it's a huge agenda, but we can, and together we really, really can. So huge thank you to everybody and uh, let's all keep in touch and make stuff happen. So thanks a lot. Bye everybody. Bye bye all, bye bye.